I'm Gene Park with Launcher, uh, the video game section at the Washington Post, and I am joined with a very special guest, Jason Schreier, news editor for Kotaku.com. Uh, Jason is, uh, I, I think it goes without saying, is one of the more consequential uh, games journalists out there. First of all, I have some concerns that you're wearing like this fancy button down shirt and I'm like here in my schlubby hoodie and I'm just like totally, totally embarrassing myself. Haven't had a haircut in months. Just like a total wreck over here. Um, so thank Clean you, Gene, for though, so embarrassing it's good. me. I did shave. I did shave yeah. this morning. Yeah, um, I decided the the quarantine beard, got to get rid of that if I'm going to be on camera. It's a great honor to have you here to talk with us because we're going to talk about a game that's very, very special and dear to us that we've both been playing for the past week or so, uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake. Um, and we both have our reviews up and Jason on Kotaku.com, and we'll have a link posted below, uh, does have a piece up talking about the, the ending of Final Fantasy VII. If you can believe it, there are actually spoilers for a remake of a 23-year-old game. And we're being very serious <laughs> about this. And I'm warning you right now that we're not going to talk about it just yet. But later on down the line, uh, we're going to be getting into spoilers. But first, we'll talk a little bit about our general impressions of the game. First, we'll talk a little bit about our general impressions of the game uh, and basically our review. Uh, so, Jason, I remember you and I were talking uh, earlier this year, and uh, you you had some concerns about the fact that the remake, uh, which is a remake of, a, of an 80-hour to 100-hour game from 1997, is only sectioning off the first four or five hours into now what is basically a 40-hour game. And, yes. and then after playing it, you kind of turn around. Yeah. Um, so yes, Final Fantasy VII Remake, I was quite critical of the fact that it's episodic because when I imagine a remake of any game, I want to see it in its entirety. I want to see the entire story. I want to play through the whole thing. Um, and the thought of just like only getting to see the Midgar portion, which in the original game is maybe four or five hours um, of the entire like 40 hour extravaganza of a story, um, that bummed me out it just made me feel like it would be incomplete for a lot of different reasons um it bummed me out that i wouldn't get to see like yuffie and sid and vincent and kate sith and um uh, all the different areas that come happen after midgar i mean the way i described it in a preview is that one of the coolest things about final fantasy 7 playing it back in the day was you leave midgar and you're like holy crap the game has just started we're now in this world map and like there are all these different cities and continents and oh my god it's huge um with this it's the opposite effect it's like okay midgar is the entire game um but when i played it and i will not get spoilery now because we'll save the spoilers for a little bit later as you said um but when i played it and got to the end i understood what they were trying to do and i think i had a better idea of where they were going with this whole remake doohickey um and even as i played i mean it's a great game um but as i played i was just like haunted by this feeling of like oh my god the story is going to be incomplete the story is going to be incomplete i'm not going to get to see all the stuff that i want to see but then when I got to the end, I feel like it clicked for me and I became less angry and more extremely curious about where they're going to go next. What, what, so what was your take, Gene? What did you think of the whole? I, I think experience? I remember saying that I was a little uh, skeptical of, of, of the, the section that the sectioning off too, because uh, as I remember it, Midgar, uh, the, 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 the cyberpunk city that Final Fantasy VII opens with, uh, famously opens with, uh, leaves an impact, right? Like you remember it forever uh, because it's so iconic and it's so different, and the the, the, the art design of the world is unique. And I, I think I referenced this uh, in one of my pieces, but it was also one of the first games that really like brought to fore like modern Japanese culture, like like in like like a video game. You know, we didn't really see too much of that with billboards, the My Bloody Valentine billboard that I, that I just can't ever forget. Um, Shinra itself is a, is a Japanese name with, with, a, with a kanji character in it. So it, it had a very, very Japanese cyberpunk flavor. Uh, flavor, And so it left a strong impression uh, aesthetically. But gameplay-wise, I remember not having that much fun with it because we were, it, it was very, very linear. And this remake is also very, very linear, too. Um, that was a question that I was wondering about. I was like, OK, they're, they're, they're going to turn this into a big game. Are they going to give us a free roam area within Midgar to do? And they kind of did that. Right, uh, with short little side quests 
like chapters that that, that yeah, you can like yeah, but it's side quests like going through hallways to to reach them. So yeah, uh, yeah, not really, not quite. Yeah, but as I played through the game uh, and seeing the story changes, and we can discuss some of those character moments uh, uh, later. Uh, I realized how much of a natural arc uh, that that first uh, Midgard section was, at least in terms of building up, uh, introducing some characters building the world and then uh having a natural like like character arcs uh, uh end uh where, where they did and so i i did miss that oh that that opening up uh, of gar um and that was the first time that you heard the overall music in final fantasy 7 the original one and it's a, such a tremendous piece of music um and i i, I wanted I, I would miss hearing that for the first time again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but given uh, everything, and given the the, the the changes that you mentioned, <laughs> it feels like we just really need to talk about the ending. Um, uh, I, I I get it now. I I get why that they did it this way, and this felt like a really natural uh, place to to end it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the English script um, because you 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 get you dedicated a, a whole paragraph, and I I was also uh, really taken aback by how well, well written. Uh, uh, it's Final Fantasy. Uh, uh, you know, I even thought about playing in Japanese again because I mentioned that so much of, of Midgar is uh, has Japanese culture. But the voice acting was excellent, and the writing and the dialogue I, I thought was surprisingly natural and, and not too cringy. So some of it was there, but it, it feels like that's just kind of based off like who the characters are and not really like what what the kind of story that they're telling here. What mm -hmm. do you think? Yeah, and there are also like a lot of grunts and like random noises and weird, a lot of things that like feel very anime, feel very like it needed to translate them over. But yeah, the, the script is surprisingly excellent. I was, um, especially compared to some recent, I mean, Final Fantasy 15 had some good moments, but there were definitely a lot of lines that made me just like roll my eyes at, at mm -hmm. the very least. Um, but yeah, the, the script of Remake was was great um i really enjoyed it and it's especially kind of uh, glaring in comparison to the original game script which was infamously as former kodaka producer tim rogers detailed in depth in a in a giant video series that is worth checking out um that script is full of issues it's full of translation errors and kind of a lot of lines that are incomprehensible there's a scene um, in kind of the, the latter part of the mid game of Final Fantasy VII towards the end of the game where he clouds uh, kind of history and personality is really dug into and it's this weird um, kind of artistic scene and the script in it is just so poorly handled that it's like you a lot of it is just not comprehensible unless you like look it up later look up what it's what, it, what they're supposed to be saying so to get a game like this that really just like treats the script with real care treats the english dialogue with real just um genuine love and thought and it's just it was really refreshing to play and the other thing that's worth noting is that a lot of jrpgs and a lot of japanese games in recent decades have gotten a lot of flack for their voice acting um often for good reason there's a lot of hammy performances there's a lot of just like intentionally exaggerated there's a lot of just awkward dialogue that doesn't translate well when spoken out loud and is much easier to just kind of ignore when you're reading it um but final fantasy 7 remake has fantastic performances all around like every single performance in the game is great in english um the dubs are fantastic the the guy who plays wedge also plays badger on breaking bad and he's yeah. excellent um all the all the superstars other than i mean you could you could certainly get into barrett being a giant racial stereotype mm -hmm. but um aside from that i mean he's still a good voice actor like the performance is still good despite being a stereotype so it's like the it, it's it's a game that's full of just like a tremendous cast and i was really impressed and and came away really stoked about that just touching on barrett real quick uh you know it, it is bad and and the, but the character itself was always a caricature mm -hmm. and uh and more of a mr t character caricature and the way i i, I take him in is like he's just a really really hype pro wrestler who just can't seem to contain himself <laughs> though. and what's yeah. funny is his hands are bigger than tifa's head yeah exactly like when you see him in the train like it's like okay like, well, like maybe we can't take this guy or like the, some of these characters a little too seriously because one everybody is ridiculously hot mm -hmm. barrett is 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 uh, is inhumanly huge so like like we have to take this at face value and say this is a cartoon about fantasy yep. characters you know yeah um go ahead 
Yeah, well, so um, something that I always found funny about a game like Final Fantasy VII is that, so the way that I describe Final Fantasy VI and VII is they're two of my favorite games of all time. Final Fantasy VI is a game that takes a bunch of ridiculous characters, like silly, funny, hilarious characters that are just making jokes and wisecracks and have ridiculous personalities and puts them into deadly serious situations. Well, Final Fantasy VII takes a bunch of seriously serious characters who take themselves very seriously and puts them into ridiculous situations, like Tifa having having a slap fight with one of Shinra's executives on the back of a giant cannon. Um, and Barrett, despite his look in this, didn't actually look all that silly in the original game. He looks a lot sillier now. And when, when everything's blown up to be really realistic, his, his giant hulking muscles just look a lot more out of place. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be, there's already a lot of great writing about um, him being a racist stereotype and how kind of, why that's a problem people who are way more qualified than me who don't have quite the as as pale skin as me can speak to that more more from a more educated perspective um but I, what I always enjoyed about the original game was it was taking characters like Barrett and Cloud and Aris and Tifa, who all are pretty serious characters, despite occasionally making a joke or two, and just putting them in some ridiculous situations from squatting in a gym to slap fights on cannons. It's, it's very fun. I thought the honeybee in uh, the infamous honeybee in uh, with the bathhouse was. Uh, I, I think that that was a moment that I think I think that was probably the moment that a lot of people were really worried about. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in my opinion, like I was thoroughly entertained. Like they oh knocked my it goodness. out of the park. I I couldn't believe like like as one character says, nailed it. You know like. Yep. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. man. Well, because they completely change it. Um, yeah. And I won't get too in depth in case people are still watching this who haven't actually played that far yet. Um, mm -hmm. But they took out anything that might have even seen like borderline homophobic or mm -hmm. transphobic or kind of uh, could be interpreted in a way that was was not great. That was kind of stereotypical like Japanese conservative culture homophobic culture and mm -hmm. they've just turned it into this like surprisingly progressive awesome sequence of events yeah I loved it I thought they knocked it out of the park it was empowering I felt powerful after after it you know <laughs> it was it, it was it was such a beautiful moment um let's talk a bit about uh some of the well let's let's dial it back a bit um the, the one thing I want to talk about is uh Jason what's your what's what has been your experience like with Final Fantasy 7 back in the day uh when did you, how did you come about it uh I know that uh you wanted to uh you, that you played FF6 yeah um, am I coming through am I coming through okay mm -hmm. my zoom says internet connection is unstable no it's am good. I good John yeah you're good Okay. Yeah. So, Jason, uh, bring us back to how you came upon the Final Fantasy and Final Fantasy VII. Uh, how did you experience it back in the day? Yeah. How can so, you talk about what I did. So, I had an NES growing up as a small, small child. My parents actually had it before I was born, even. Um, and so, Final Fantasy, the original, um, NES was one of my first games ever and I would always I would play it It was one of those games where like when you're a little kid you don't really know how to play video games especially a game as complicated and as difficult as the original Final Fantasy so I remember I would always get up to this there's an early dungeon in the game called the Marsh Cave that is super difficult and all about resource management and requires a lot of skills that you don't have when you're like five years old so I would always get that far and then just like wouldn't be able to make it any further without dying and then I just restart and keep playing like i'd play over and over again i would just play that first opening sequence of the game over and over again um hey, i then, used to do that too i used to do that too just play the first part and i'm like mm -hmm. that was my game that, that yep. that's the story that i'm telling right exactly and yeah. like i would read the strategy guide so i knew the rest of the game even though i hadn't really gotten that far until much oh later oh my god um, yeah. But so yeah i did the so, same thing too i never actually beat ff1 but i know the last boss is chaos yep, so yep. <laughs> yeah those strategy guides were just killer man i miss i miss those old they great high quality strategy guides um so yeah so and then uh from there i was older when i got a super nintendo and so final fantasy 4 which was called 2 in the us back then that was really my first like actually diving into this finishing the game like loving the story and that was the game that just like blew my mind because i was like wow these video games can like make me care about characters like i didn't i didn't see that coming i didn't think that was possible and then from there i played final fantasy 6 VI or 3 and all the other like square soft classic of classics of the era the secret of manas and the chrono triggers and the more obscure ones like the lufias and the illusions of gaia's um illusions and so of gaia. 
Yeah. yeah so Final <laughs> Fantasy VI, which was called three back then, that was the one that kind of cemented things for me as like, wow, this is my favorite series ever. Like I love, I love these games so much. Um, played that over and over again as a kid, um, as like a middle schooler. And then when I heard that Final Fantasy was moving from Nintendo to the PlayStation, I had to buy a PlayStation. <laughs> that was that was the big thing and and i'm sure there were millions of other people who were in the same exact boat that that just like as soon as you find out that final fantasy is no longer a nintendo it's like you got to move along with it and alongside that all of square's other rpgs around the final fantasy so i got final fantasy 7 uh, i don't remember if it was the day it came out in the u.s but it was definitely like around when it came out and i remember just like jumping in and just like devouring it over the course of a few days um i remember being spoiled of, about the big twist the big death on some internet message board as mm-hmm. as one does as internet message boards do and yeah. did even 23 years ago internet yeah. message boards they're just people being jerks and spoiling games because it had come out in japan a few months earlier so people on the internet like had an idea of what happened and they would just post like giant forum topics titles being like such and such dies such and such dies um i'm I'm being nice even though most people probably know it just in case there's some newcomers here um yeah but yeah that was uh that that sucked but um but i love the game and so that was my final fantasy that's kind of a the long-winded version of my final fantasy journey over the past sure i basically had the same journey uh uh, six was also my favorite too uh and then when seven came on of course i needed to get a playstation uh i did a piece about how like integral uh final fantasy was to the identity of the playstation Mm -hmm. uh its roots as a nintendo 64 yes i enjoyed that piece yes yeah yeah um, but when it, when it came to Final Fantasy VII, I had a, like a weird version, mixed version of what you went through and what our friend Tim Rogers uh, went through, where Tim ha- had a g- good grasp of Japanese language and he was able to play it. I was only beginning to learn Japanese at the time. Uh, I was a first year Japanese student and I imported the game uh, and I started playing it with the, sticking the pen in the disk drive of the PlayStation 1 to make sure that it could read it. And I played through the entire game in Japanese, uh, brute forced my way through, not understanding a goddamn thing about the story <laughs> uh, because the visuals re- were just so amazing. And when so-and-so died, I wasn't even upset about it. So the Bambi moment in video games just completely missed me by because I was just <laughs> so eager to be a first adopter. And I was mostly upset that I leveled uh, that person up and, and uh, <laughs> now they were gone. Yeah, So. yeah. That was, well, my journey, so. it, that was i mean even just that fact alone that was like unprecedented at the time that you the a game would allow you to like put all this investment into a character only to take them away from you that itself was just like such a gut punch even if you didn't understand the language like the fact that it it affected you even in that way is is pretty cool mm-hmm. yeah the fact that it, it's that it's still a memory that sticks out uh, the, uh even in terms of like the actual like uh extrinsic value of it right um uh the, Let's talk about a little bit about uh, the, something that I think we both agreed was was kind of a weakness with side missions in this game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought they were pretty boring, and and uh, they were the things that were really holding me back in terms of finishing it, because I was like, okay, I need to like this is FF seven. I need to finish every side quest, right? Yep. And then as I got through like half of them, I was like, do I really need to finish all of them? I don't know. <laughs> You know, and then so I kind of like gamble my way through um, and then the game does give you a way to uh, um, uh, do them again later. But uh, yeah, you also mentioned that they're they're, they're pretty uh, 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 a little dull, right? Yes, um, they are definitely the weakest. The, the weakest part of the game, I would say in general, is anything they added to try to make sure it was 40 hours long. So that's the side quest. That's padding out some of the dungeons. Like, for example, in chapter five and six, they do a lot of padding to the dungeons that are right before um, the second Mako reactor that you had as a crew to destroy. And in the original oh. game, that whole like getting into the Mako reactor right, takes like three minutes, five minutes. Mm-hmm. And in this game, it takes two hours because it just adds they added all this dungeon stuff to it um and that a lot of that was unnecessary um the sewer level i saw you uh you talking about sewer levels on twitter sewer levels are always the worst and remain the worst in this game yeah it just feels like um square enix in a game that seems in a lot of ways to be unafraid to um 
unafraid of fan pressure and unafraid of what hardcore fans will think it's too bad that square also felt the need to just like pad it as much as possible and make it feel like a 40 hour game like you know that this was a bunch of people sitting in a room a bunch of their head haunches at square being like people will not be happy if this game is 20 hours like they won't see it as a proper final fantasy unless it's 40 hours long and a lot of the stuff they've added to do to make that happen is actually pretty good. A lot of story stuff and a lot of character stuff, but a lot of the stuff they added is just feels like filler. And that is too bad for those of us who are adults and don't have a ton of spare time. But then again, I'm replaying all of Persona 5. So who am I to, to really complain about filler? Yeah, I mean, I'm replaying the side missions now too because, like, I I have the the luxury of time to go through them. But you can you can easily tell that they were very 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 transparent transparently padding like none of those like not not none i don't want to say none but a good chunk of those extra scenarios in the dungeons definitely could have been left out and the game would not have been any worse for it whatsoever exactly yeah, yeah. agreed um so i think we the, this is the moment we've all been waiting for let's talk about the ending so Spoilers. Uh, all right jason you have a piece up on friday uh the, the, let's talk which the, with the headline Let's talk about Final Fantasy VII Remake's mind-boggling ending. Um, I So throughout the game, uh, uh, there is a new presence uh, that you notice. Um, and apologies to our video producer who has listened to this too, uh, because he's also a fan and uh, he has to listen to this. There is a new presence at the beginning of the game that makes you wonder, okay, what's going on here? Um, and they keep coming up during key scenes of, of the original story. The uh, Dementors, they look like the Dementors. The Dementors, or the Whisperers of Fate, right? They basically are there to make sure that the story is following the original plot. Um, how do you interpret the, the what, what, what was your reaction to this to this ghost? Uh, yeah, ghost? man. Oh, or, should man. We, should, or should we talk about the ultimate effect of, of the ghosts uh, overall? Just to yeah, it well, up, ultimately, right? you yeah. kill them, you destroy them, and they're gone. And now you have officially changed the timeline, and suddenly, from now on, everything's new and so I think it's brilliant I think it's a brilliant twist but I'm of the mind so I know a lot of people out there a lot of hardcore Final Fantasy fans of which I am one but there are a lot who disagreed with me on this and wanted a one-to-one -one remake they wanted to play Final Fantasy 7 again with HD graphics and beautiful sound and see all of these things see a pretty much the same story that they saw before and that's fine if you want that but I'm just not interested in that I'm of the belief that that I can just pick up Final Fantasy Fantasy 7 the original on my switch which i've been doing and just play through it all again if i want to see that story i wanted something completely new and mm -hmm. so um first of all i was kind of bummed out that they were spending so much of square enix's development time on this like multi-part saga one of the reasons i was so bummed out about it being episodic is because i knew how much time it would take them and how much of square's resources would now instead of being devoted to new things be devoted to this remake so to see that the end of the game that the big twist of this game is that this is the only part that's actually a remake and the rest will just be who knows what that is fantastic to me i want new stuff give me like all these characters in new situations give me a, a storyline where zach comes in and sephiroth dies halfway through and Genova comes and has a second alien and who knows i i just want i want to be completely surprised i want totally new stuff i love it i love the way they're going with it the one part that has me kind of like worried raising an eyebrow or a little bit skeptical is the fact that this is <laughs> the director of this game, Tetsuya Nomura, is also the director of Kingdom Hearts, and Kingdom Hearts yeah. is not exactly known for its comprehensible storylines. And already the fact that they're leaving it so ambiguous at the end as to whether there's an alternate timeline where Zack survives, whether that's like supposed to be a flashback in this timeline and you just changed it a little bit. Um, I'm a little worried that we're going to start getting into like nonsensical plot lines involving time travel and alternate realities. So I guess put a pin on that in that one. But um, but I'm excited at the prospect of just like totally new stuff. Um, the other thing it allows them to do, and I'm sure um, that this was their biggest concern going into a Final Fantasy VII remake, is it allows them to not do a world map. And doing a world map, some sort of like HD creation of a world map, I'm sure was like one of the biggest hiccups this whole time, because how do you make a world? When in, in the PS1 games and all the old RPGs, world maps feel like these big metaphors, right? Like when you walk around on the world map, Cloud is the same size as Midgar. They're, they're, you, you recognize that it's just like, okay, obviously Midgar isn't this tiny thing. It's like an icon that represents Midgar. And when you actually go inside, it's much bigger. 
Um, communicating but travel. To, but, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But you can't translate yeah. that to realistic graphics. It would just look absurd. And like the whole idea of this remake Huge. is that you're getting rid of the need for metaphor. So yeah. I think that yeah. was a big hiccup. And I think now knowing that they're going to change things entirely following this game, the unknown journey, as they called it at the end, Chiron, um, I can see them just being like, you know what, we're not going to do a world map because this game is going to go into all sorts of other directions. So I think we'll still see like the Golden Saucer and Costa del Sol and all the other okay. good stuff, um, all the other stuff people wanted to see from Final Fantasy VII, but what we won't see is a world map and who knows what order they'll be in. That's interesting. Uh, uh, first of all, I'll talk about the world map for a bit um, because uh, it was a problem that I was also worried about too, because I don't think that they did, they, I definitely don't think they solved it in FF15. Um, the map in FF15, uh, the, by the way, uh, I, I, which I am a fan of, I enjoyed FF15 quite a bit, but I will say that the open world was not quite as good or not even great, not even nearly that good. Yeah, as, talking as about any menial other... side quests. Talking about yeah, that yeah, that, that that was terrible side quests. Um, so at, at least I got what I was grateful for. At least some of the direction we got here versus that that just seemed like complete nonsense. Um, but talking a little, oh God, where, where was it going with this? Well, map. Yeah, no, no. You, you were saying something earlier about um, uh, the oh the changes. You know, the, the, uh, it was interesting to me because, like, like we 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 see in the story that that we have all these character moments that are expanded upon, and we are finding new character quirks about these characters that we didn't really know about or or were only implied originally. And it feels like almost the characters are almost aware of their fate, and that mm -hmm. they're 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 trying different things out this time, right? It almost feels like, it, it, like you know, I hate to, I hate the word meta, but it definitely feels meta, like a conversation with the with the writers and developers uh -huh. about like this is something we really want to do. Yeah, like, like, well, like, you could argue that the whispers of time are very meta. Maybe they're the developers or they're the hardcore fans trying to mm -hmm. trying to rein everybody in and be like, nope, you got to stay on track. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there are hints that like something is not as it seems. Cloud is um, has flashbacks throughout the game that he should not have flashbacks to. Like at first, mm -hmm. it starts off with flashbacks to Nibelheim, which okay, mm -hmm. obviously that was in his past. But then you see he starts seeing things like the reunion, which happens mm -hmm. later in the game, and then mm -hmm. Aerith, uh, Aerith let's say Aerith, something happening to Aerith. Now, now we're in spoiler mode. We're so in spoiler territory. So, so Aerith dies in, in 1987. Yes. yes. Um, he sees Aerith's death when he should not have seen that. And so there, and then towards the end, they all see the, the end scene of Final Fantasy VII, which is Red 13 and his two cubs, like, patrolling through the desert so yeah. i think there's an implication that all of this has happened before and that like the original game has happened in the canon mm -hmm. of this game and so that this game is just like like existing in the universe where the original game has already happened and for some reason things are happening again it's crazy it's again this is why i'm a little worried that it's going to get into like kingdom hearts like oh. everything makes no sense territory but i'm optimistic i'd rather have new stuff than especially if it's if the next game and the next however many games there are if they're handled as well as elegantly and as with as much care as this game was then it'll be fantastic i'm with you there uh i would say before playing this game that i would be very very worried even even hearing about the direction like mm -hmm. you know this ending has been leaked for about at least about a week or so uh, yes. on, on on the dark web so people are reacting to the information that they get versus what, what, what they're playing. In the context of the whole game and, and the ending, you definitely do feel a lot more confident in Tetsuya Nomura's and the writing staff's uh, uh, ability to be able to weave an interesting story while still having some weird Kingdom Hearts crap going on in the background, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, and they haven't really been able to, well, they do that for some people with Kingdom Hearts. It didn't really work for me, but... <laughs> Um, but but for me, it seems like that they're able to kind of they they finally found some kind of good writing voice that makes sense uh, with clear characters uh, with humor and and smarts. Uh, I was really surprised at how how the characters really seemed aware of what was going on yeah. a little bit more more than, than than they should have actually. Which is uh -huh. why like when those flashbacks were happening, I was like, is Cloud like an FF seven FF seven player from back yeah, in the day? Yeah, he played it. <laughs> he's like, yeah, it. he got one of those Midgard TVs and hooked up a PlayStation. He was like, oh yeah. man, this game is great. Yeah, it just felt like that the game was having a conversation with itself, like, 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 do I want to be this or not? Which mm -hmm. is why you get to your first, your next point, um, where why there's no Final Fantasy VII Remake Part One or yeah. Final Fantasy Remake yeah. One. 
because you believe that this is the only part that will be the actual remake. Yep. I think the next part will be called like Final Fantasy VII Rebirth or something like that. Oh it'll be, uh, <laughs> it'll be, it'll be some crazy, crazy Nomura stuff. Um, yeah, it, it makes sense. And I was initially skeptical. I, in fact, I called it misleading that they didn't have a part one on it. And I still think it's misleading because people are going to pick up this game expecting it to be a remake of the game. Uh, but I guess if you look at it as them saying, actually, when we say remake, we mean we mean mean literally the characters are going to remake their their fates and remake this game, um, and that that kind of changes the angle of it. So I definitely don't think it's as egregious um, uh, as I did in the past. Like I think it's uh, uh, now that I understand what they're going for, I'm a, a lot more stoked about it and ready to give them more of the benefit of the doubt. Oh yeah, that's what I was going to refer to you earlier. Uh, uh, I remember you said that you wanted something completely new, and then mm -hmm. like, like for people who did want something more, more, more uh, note to note, uh, uh, they might be a little bit disappointed. I was yeah. somebody who who was expecting and was excited for a note to note re a remake, right? Yep. I, I didn't. I, I wouldn't necessarily discourage anything new, and uh, in fact, I do find it very exciting. I was super excited, and like like you, I had this this ending hasn't been able to leave my brain for like the past week. Yeah. Um, but I was, but I definitely felt like a pretty strong tinge of disappointment when I realized that uh, if if fans of Evangelion, the, the, the classic Japanese Japanese anime, know uh, the, the show came out in the '90s, and now the the director Hideaki Anno is making a rebuild movies, which was originally built as a remake of the show, but just with higher production values and 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 everything. Sounds familiar, right? Mm -hmm. And then halfway through the four-part movie series, you realize that he's actually telling a completely different story. Yeah. Um, and so, so, so I got flashbacks to that feeling again, which wasn't exactly positive. Mm -hmm. It was confusing, right? And then, but then, I'm, but now that I'm used to it and and I've let it settle for a bit, then then I'm definitely more excited. Especially now that I'm replaying it through again and I'm seeing all the all, all just the, the writing and everything that that that's got a lot more. Yeah. And it's like okay, they 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 they're, they're really confident. Uh, in what they're doing here which yes. is which is which is nice to see for one yeah you know? yeah well it's written i mean the game is a lot of the people who worked on this game including the people at the very top are people who made the original game it's not like a bunch of new fans coming in yeah. although i'm sure there are a lot of younger workers also but in japan especially um there's a culture of like you work at a company and you stay there for a very long time obviously there are many exceptions and there are many people who don't but in the case of Kitase and Nomura and Nojima and a lot of the people who are higher ups at Square Enix, these are guys who have been there since the 90s, since the original game came out. And I think that gives you like a confidence when you're writing these characters because these are characters you created that you know and have known for 23 years. Like these characters, Cloud has been in so many different things from Smash Brothers to Advent Children to random mass other fighting games like Air Guys and stuff Air like Guys, that. yes. Um, so, so these are characters. Air, that, Air Guys gets the first mentioned in the washington post congratulations yes, nice. everyone nice <laughs> um so these are characters that like have been around and so i think that that gives the writing staff an ability to capture their essence in a way that you can't really do when you're coming up with something brand new um and so i think there's something there's there's definitely a recipe for like the rest of the series to be really special and that that's exciting i'm i'm no longer when when part two is announced and revealed and talked about i will be a lot less cynical and skeptical than i was with this one i think what are you what are you expecting part two uh, or whatever they might call it final fantasy 7 rebirth or revolution or <laughs> <laughs> or whatever yeah and, well, i don't so... i don't get it, i don't get it with video game subtitles and 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 the the the, the prefix re i blame the matrix for that yeah. But yeah. yeah um so yeah so uh i i mean obviously the the point is that we don't know what to expect but mm -hmm. actually i think that um, we'll see a lot of the same locations that you see in the original. I wouldn't be shocked if they cut out parts like Calm, for example, which is the first town that you visit after Midgar. And it's this sleepy little town that has nothing much of consequence and it only exists so you can go into an inn and listen to Cloud do a flashback have a, for a while. Have a flashback. Um, That's really what, flashback. what Calm yeah, was. I've already heard the Calm theme in the game. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. One thing, one thing that we know is that like a lot of the the, the beautiful music musical motifs that we hear throughout mm -hmm. the entire uh, original game are just pushed up earlier in this one, um, yes. which was kind of a treat. And also like when I heard the overworld theme early, I was like, 
I, I kind of would have wanted to save that for for later, but now I get why they didn't save that for later because who yeah. knows what they're going to do, right? There definitely won't be an overworld. Um, I think yeah. they'll. I wouldn't be surprised if they cut out parts like Calm, um, but maybe they'll add it. Maybe they'll surprise us. But I do think that the next few hours, at least, will follow a lot of the same path as um, as the original game. I think we're still going to go to Juna in the Cannon City. I think we're still going to dress up like Shinra sailors and get and stow away in a boat on a boat. Um, um, and and chase after Rufus, and um, I think you're still gonna have to Slap run away from is, the Midgar. Slap so fight is probably still gonna be there somewhere. Slap fight will still be there. That's a little bit later, but yeah, um, I think you'll still go to the Golden Saucer, and I think you'll still meet Dine, Barrett's uh, Barrett's old buddy. Um, so I, I still think a lot of that stuff will be intact. I think that a it'll it could be in a different order or presented in a pretty different way, um, and b I think that the overarching storyline will be very different i think maybe zach will pop up in 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 this timeline and maybe we'll get some shenanigans there maybe the next game will start with you playing as zach for a oh, while and oh and god. do pull a kingdom hearts 2 oh with, my god uh, with, with the beginning of the game it's just like a few hours of you playing as someone else entirely um yeah. i think sephiroth will be more of a presence like he was in this game um i think that that a lot of just they'll change a lot of the bosses and fights and and do a lot of the same stuff that they did for this except go even further in like wilder directions i would be shocked if they were if they just like got rid of like changed everything we know about this world because mm -hmm. they made it clear that like wutai is in the game and, and the golden mm -hmm. saucer is in the game so all the stuff mm -hmm. we know is still in the game cosmo canyon is in the game um so we're still gonna have a lot of the same beats it just mm -hmm. might feel very different as a whole and it might be less of a one-to-one -one comparison the way that that this game is which makes sense because if you look at this game and you look at the way they stretch things out the way that they they turned like even the easiest bosses into like three part like crazy um impossible difficult like well not impossible but like extravaganzas three part extravaganzas um mm -hmm. You, you can't really see that lasting for another 200 hours if they just yeah. do the same thing to every single part of Final Fantasy VII. So I can see it making a lot more sense to compress stuff starting now and squeeze stuff together and tear stuff apart and put different things in different places. And yeah, I'm excited to see it. I, I would be... I, if I had to guess about the overall structure, I would think that it would be three parts and that the second mm -hmm. part would be up until where Aris should die and then maybe mm -hmm. she won't die or maybe it'll be a cliffhanger or something like mm -hmm. that. And then the third game tells the rest. It just feels like an elegant way to do it is to divide it into three parts, like three discs the original game came mm -hmm. in. Um, I think if they went longer than that, it would risk feeling way too bloated and way too mm -hmm. like, oh my God, I can't believe they're still coming out with new parts of this game. So I think okay. three is a perfect number. Um, two would be even better, but I think three is, is what they're going to wind up going with. Um, the one big question I have, and I don't really know the answer to this or what it even could be, is are they really going to let you transfer your progress and continue like building up levels and getting new material and stuff or are they going to start from scratch um mm -hmm. oftentimes when game developers make sequels they want to like figure out what didn't work in the first game and tweak things and fix things and so like i wouldn't be shocked if the developers wanted to do a little bit different things with the battle system this next time around and maybe change some of the material and the way that weapons work or whatever else they want to do so mm -hmm. are they going to be able to do that and start from scratch are you mm -hmm. going to transfer your levels will it will it feel like weird if you can't actually transfer your progress like will that feel like you're 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 losing something along the way i don't know lots of lots of lingering questions here. i guess i i feel like i might know the answer after finishing the game i feel like i know the answer that i, I feel like that they won't let us transfer at least our levels uh what i'm hoping for is that they would at least transfer our materia you know mm. um we leveled it up uh we have it we have the slots i don't think that they're going to change how the slots are going to work or what materials that the base materials that we did get um, I would I would hope that they at least get to keep that just to at least have some sense of continuity yeah. because I... because we can still grind this game. I'm level 45 now um, yeah. and, and I beat the game in like level 37 and I'm I'm, I'm still in I, I kind of intend to go to level 99 with this game just mm -hmm. <laughs> well just out of tradition uh, because I did it in the original game and, uh -huh. and because because what else am I going to do right? Um, so, right, you're I, you're stuck inside. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I the rather, problem with that is that yeah. like one of the one of the kind of like uh, 
characteristics of an RPG, of any RPG, but especially a Final Fantasy game, is that there's a certain scale of things, and you expect a certain things. Like, like you expect certain things to happen at certain different times based on the pacing of the game. So you expect fire to be your go-to for a while until Fyra becomes your go-to, and then Fyraga becomes your go-to later in the game. And so by this point, at the end of part one, we've already gotten to Fyraga. We've already gotten mm -hmm. Leviathan and Bahamut and like the, the highest level yeah. summons. Um, I didn't actually get the highest level summons, but you can get them in this game. So if the whole idea of like of a game like this is is often that you can't get that stuff until towards the end. Um, otherwise, the pacing feels totally weird. It feels like you shouldn't have the highest level stuff at the beginning of the game or else you just breeze through everything and there's nothing to attain for. There's nothing to try to attain. There's nothing to strive for. Um, so yeah, so it's I, I can't imagine them doing that, but who knows? I don't know what kind of solution they have. I'm sure they've thought of something. Yeah. Uh, the one last question, um, and I think this, this might have been better for the first part, so whatever. But Jason, how do you think people who this is something that you and I can't like relate to? How do you think yeah. people who never played Final Fantasy VII would, would react to everything we saw? Because when I was <laughs> playing it, I kept trying to think like, how are our Final Fantasy VII versions going to take this? Because this is so confusing to me. Yeah, you know, they won't um, understand a word of it. Yeah, they yeah. won't understand anything. I, I think anyone who hasn't played the original game will finish it and have no idea what just happened because the game doesn't even try to explain who Zach is. Zach just pops up like and yeah. Zach just has this showdown with Midgar. And if you haven't played Final Fantasy VII, if you don't know the story at that point, you're just completely lost. Like there is I'm, I'm curious to hear what people who haven't played it think because I think they'll just have to look up the ending online. Like it's just a fact that you won't understand what happened unless you have played the original and know what all these things are and who they are and what they it's, mean it's 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 why i i thought that the zach uh, uh scene was was a flashback and not necessarily the timeline changing because it's like they can't just introduce zach out of nowhere like 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 maybe they sure, may, did. They, they sure did but maybe they're just introducing another character like they did in the original one here's a guy that kind of looks like cloud with black hair and who has cloud sword Ooh, who is he like like why is he approaching midgar but then i saw the dog breed change on Stamp. Mm -hmm. And we, which was such a clever storytelling device. So the, mm -hmm. the, throughout the whole the whole thing, that's a new character. Um, and then when I saw that, I was like, "Oh my god, is that why they introduced a dog?" I was like, <laughs> just, yep. just to just to more clearly communicate that that things that that things definitely change in this timeline yep. Yep. versus yep. Yep. what we what we saw thirty hours earlier. Yep. Um, and yeah, and also, I mean, Zach is not supposed to survive that last stand. So when he's yeah. like limping with Cloud, or when he's carrying Cloud to Midgard, the implication is that he survived when he shouldn't have. And so it's, yeah, it's going to be interesting times. It's going to be wild to see what they do. And now the, after saying it, I'm like 90% confident that the second game is going to open up with like a two hour playable Zack sequence. And, <laughs> and that's how Nomura is going to start this game. Oh my God. And also uh, the last line in the game, uh, Aerith talked about how, how much she misses the Midgar sky. Mm -hmm. um, it's also the, the last thing in your piece where you wondered why, uh, why she, or was it? Was it yeah, you, I was or? wondering why she it, said it, that. I was wondering well, why, if why? it was, I was trying to figure out if it like had some deeper meaning or something, or if she was foreshadowing something. I'm not sure. I did too, yeah. But I also thought of it as like a, like a like a nice little character moment again because they they really built up Aerith as this really like city girl who mm -hmm. knows her way around, who 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 really adapts to life as it happens around her. Um, and now with all these changes, um, like I took that as like I'm I'm scared about all these changes that are mm -hmm. happening to me, you know. Yep. Um, yep. And and that that's what made it personal for me, you know, like. And then it says the unknown journey continues. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh my God, I'm going to cry right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm... man. It's, I just hope it doesn't take too much longer for the next couple of games to come out. Um, I hope we're not winning another five years. Like, Hopefully, I mean, if they can get it out next year, wonderful. Hopefully, I, I, more realistically, I think, especially with the coronavirus, I think 2022 is probably uh, when I would expect to see part two of this game. And I don't know. I hope it. I hope it's good. I hope I hope this story doesn't I, I, doesn't go totally off the rails. I hope so too, and I think that's probably why they also decided on Unreal Engine, or at least that's the benefit of the Unreal Engine. That it just it, it'll just help them with turnaround time faster versus their 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 native Luminous Engine, which which I like, but clearly didn't work well for them in FF15. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's all the time we have. Uh, we talked quite a bit about FF7, a lot longer than I expected. Uh, but I, I, but I, I presume that we could probably talk about this game for days, and we for probably many days. will be. 
<laughs> well, we'll be talking about it for many days. Well, actually, this podcast is being split into three parts, and this one is just the first of of the experience. <laughs> well, we'll, well, we'll have a, a the, the unknown post. journey will continue. The unknown days. journey will continue, and Jason and I will 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 we'll get back here and 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 just work through our feelings together. So. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> All right. Well, Jason Schreier of Kotaku.com, thank you so much. It's been a, such a pleasure and a real honor to have you here. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Gene. Much appreciated.